This is part two of my analysis of Owen Shears' poem, Mammoth's Wood. Part one is there. I do recommend that you watch part one first, that way everything that happens in this video is going to make so much more sense to you. So yeah, go and watch that bit first. For you clever people who've already watched part one, welcome to part two. In this video, I will finish analysing the poem, go through its themes, and go through the poem's meaning, mood, and the poet's motivation. So with all that out of the way, here is part two. This is where part one of my analysis of Mamet's Wood finished with the poem's fifth stanza and the three questions associated with it. Hopefully you've had time to maybe make some of your own annotations in response to those questions, but in just a moment you'll see some of my annotations in response to them as well. So Liam in the video, back over to you. So I think that the adverbial phrase this morning indicates that the effects of war are still being felt today. The metaphor, a broken mosaic of bone, alludes to war's power as it completely destroyed the soldiers, reducing them to tiny broken fragments. However, mosaics, being an art form, also have connotations of beauty. Perhaps Shears is suggesting that the sacrifices that the soldiers made were beautiful and should be honoured. So the Dance Macabre is also known as the Dance of the Dead and is an artistic allegory, which means a piece of art with a deeper moral message. The Dance Macabre comes from the Middle Ages and is about the universality of death. It depicts people from all walks of life being led by death to their graves, and so acts as a reminder that no matter who you are in life, death will unite you with your fellow man. This helps to remind the reader of the fragility of life, and suggests that it doesn't matter who you are or what you have because, somewhat grimly, death will still come for you. Here is the poem's sixth stanza. The middle line is possibly my favourite in the whole poem, so of course I've given you a question about that one. In fact, there are one, two, three questions in total for this stanza, so you know, pause the video, have a go. The repetition of those harsh plosive sounds, which in this case are the t, k, b, d, and g sounds, could be said to mimic the sound of the machine gun fire, which caused the soldiers' heads to be tilted back at an angle. You could even argue that this line shows that war's power is so strong that it forces its way into the very sounds of poetry. The embedded clause, those that have them, emphasises the devastation of war as it makes it clear that some of the soldiers were terribly disfigured. There's a number of shocking images in this stanza, such as the soldier's boots, the heads tilted back at an abnormal angle, or the soldiers without jaws. All of these images emphasise how brutal war was, but also how wasteful it was, as it took the lives of so many young men. And here we have the poem's final stanza. In fact, there are one, two, three questions. Have a read, have a think, and if you feel up to it, share your analysis down in the comments section too. So by suggesting that the soldiers are freed by their unearthing, 
Shears may be conveying the idea that we must acknowledge the atrocities of war if we are to ever move on from them. The end rhyme between sung and tongues emphasises the idea of song that appears to be quite central to this stanza. This is interesting as songs carry a heavy emotional weight, and yet we are not told which emotion to attach to these songs. Are they celebratory, sombre or something else? Of course, ending the poem with the notion of singing does connect it back to the poem's context, particularly the nationality of the soldiers in this poem. The soldiers haven't necessarily chosen to sing though. Slipped makes it sound like an accident, whilst absent also suggests a lack of agency. The presentation of the soldiers as being passive and powerless is something that we saw earlier in the poem. Just to conclude our analysis of this poem, I would like to consider it as a whole and pay a bit more attention to its structure. So there's actually only one, two questions that I'd like to think about here. So how about you pause the video and see if you can make your own annotations. So Mamet's Wood is an elegy, which is a sad and mournful poem that is often a lament for the dead. The nice or infuriating, I guess it depends on your perspective, thing about elegies is that they have no set structure and they are more defined by their tone and topic. However, the use of long sentences and enjambment and caesura throughout this poem helps to create a slow, reflective tone, which in turn helps to make this poem an elegy. Through writing an elegy, Shears is paying tribute to the soldiers that history has forgotten. You could argue that the poem's parallel lines could represent the way ploughed fields look. By using the small fragmentary tercets, which is a fancy way of saying three line stanzas, Shears could also be trying to represent the fragmented remains of the soldiers. Be careful of relying too much on comments like these two though, as they're not necessarily always the most detailed. Maybe use them as small additional comments, but don't base an entire essay or paragraph on them. And that is the poem analysed in depth. Now we are going to consider the three M's of the poem. And if that means nothing to you, I recommend that you have a quick look at the second video in this series, which is the second part of my analysis of The Manhunt, a link for which is appearing on screen now. So there is my summary of the poem's meaning or the story that it is telling. What do you think? Have I missed anything essential out? And here is my summary of the poem's mood. It was quite hard to condense the mood into such a short space, as I do feel like it changes quite a bit. So what do you think? Have I oversimplified the poem? And there is my brief summation of the poet's motivation for writing this poem. I've tried to squeeze in quite a bit of context, as well as a few different examples of evaluative verbs. What do you think? Let me know down in the comments section below. Here we have a theme table, and again, this is something that I explained back in that second part of my analysis of the Manhunt. To summarise that really quickly, I think you might find it useful to have a large table that contains those themes at the very top and then a row down the side for each of the 18 anthology poems. 
So if I was filling out this grid, this is what I might have done. I've ticked power because the soldiers are presented as being powerless. I don't think that this is really a poem about nature because it's not about birds and animals or flowers. I don't think that this is necessarily a love poem, but Shears certainly respects and honours the soldiers. This poem is definitely about war and time. We see how even time hasn't yet healed the wounds caused by war. I do think that this is a place poem as it's about a specific place and man's interaction with that place seems to feature quite heavily in the poem. It is about a group of men, so I would call this poem a poem about man for sure. It's hard to say that this poem is not about death. And I don't really think there's much that is religious about this poem. So those are my thoughts about what this poem's themes might be. Do you agree or disagree with me though? Please do let me know down in the comment section. Once again, we're going to be using Venn diagrams to help us revise. They are a nice visual way to see similarities and differences between poems and can be useful for those of you who may be more mathsy or sciencey, I think. So set up a large Venn diagram on a piece of paper with the question, how is war presented across different anthology poems as its title? Give one circle the title of Mamet's Wood as it will be about that poem and as for the title of the other circle, well, that's your choice. Which anthology poem will you compare it to? You could pick The Soldier, which shows war in a very positive light, or you could go for the opposite and write about the negative effects of war, as seen in Dolce e Decorum Est. How about comparing this poem to A Wife in London, which is also about somebody dealing with a death caused by war? Whatever you choose, once you've chosen your second poem, complete the Venn diagram. Use the middle bit to include details of any similarities that the poems have. For instance, do they use language, imagery or structure in similar ways? Do they use titles in similar ways? Use the non-overlapping bits to write down the differences between the poems. So what only happens in Mamet's Wood? What only happens in the other poem. Remember that you can include both ideas in the Venn diagram and also techniques. Whatever it is that you're using to compare the poems though, you must remember to use quotations. So if you have listened to that guidance or read the instructions on your screen, and no worries if you need to pause the video or rewind because that was quite a lot to take in then you might end up with something like that. So there's my example. I chose to compare Mamet's Wood with Dolce e Decorum Est. I've put in two similarities as well as two comparable differences, which I've color coded for the sake of clarity. And if I was making this for real, I would definitely do that so that my notes are easier to understand. I have also specifically not used too many quotations in this example, but that's only so you don't just copy my example without using your own brain. In your version, you would obviously add quotations to all of your ideas. And also if I was doing this for real, I would make sure that I had more ideas than just these four. The more comparisons you make up to a point, of course, the better. And there we go, that is Mamet's Wood done. Well done for getting all of the way through these two videos. I know they've probably been quite long. I really do hope that they have helped you with your English Lit revision and that you feel much more confident with this poem and its connections now. If you do feel like this video has helped you out at all, please do let me know by giving it a like. and why not subscribe to my channel and turn on the notification bell too? 
That way you will get all of my GCSE English revision videos straight into your subscription feed. And there's a loads more to come, I promise. Feel free to use the comments section down below, either letting me know how much this video has helped you, or asking a question about this poem, or adding some of your own ideas, which I think would be awesome to see. Doing any of those things also helps my videos to reach even more people, so please do help me to help even more people. As ever, I hope you have an awesome rest of the day. And remember to take frequent short breaks from revision, as a burnt out student is not a happy or successful student. So how is a soldier like a broken bird's egg? Well, if we take the soldiers of the 38th Welsh Division, we could say that, much like a broken bird's egg, they were once full of life and potential but instead they are left fragile and the potential for life that they could have had has been replaced with an overwhelming sense of dread and death. 